We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we're tackling a question I have been asked a number of times. For example, Emmett O'Brien went over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicked on Ask the Bellhop to ask, I have an at-work board game day coming up on the 10th. I don't have control of this event. Basically, I'm looking for any games I can bring or suggest to be played during 15-minute breaks or one-hour lunches. I've made some suggestions already, hoping to make it likely that games do get played, but do you have any suggestions? Now, we've got a couple other similar questions on our question hat as well, but even just this weekend at our board games at the Barbershop Bar open game night, a local gamer, Scott, noted he started playing games during his work breaks, but he's looking for suggestions of games that can be set up, played, and finished in under half an hour. This is also a question I see come up a lot on social media with posts like, Mm -hmm. need some games to bring to work tomorrow to play during break. Go! Definitely see that quite often. Now, I do wonder if any of this has to do with people swapping back to physically going to a workplace again after spending a lot of time at home and getting more into board gaming. Once you start gaming, there's no end. Whatever the reason for it is, we're here to help. So Emmett is looking for 15-minute games, but also one-hour lunch break games. While I know a few people have lunch breaks that are an hour long, you got to remember you also have to fit in eating there, and you don't want to eat while you're playing games. We've talked about that before. Try to separate the gaming with the eating. At least keep the food on a side table away from the games. Now, Scott's looking for half-hour games. And I got to say, I think the average work break is probably closer to about 20 minutes to half an hour. So what I think we're going to do is we are going to limit it to games that can be played in under half an hour. Now, when talking about half an hour or less games, we're going to include setup, teardown, calculating scores, etc. But this won't include teaching the game. Hopefully, teaching the game is something you only have to do once. Yeah, Scott actually brought up that for his events, whenever he brings a new game, he does a rule teach during first break, and then they actually play the game during the next break, which I got to say is a great way to do it. You may also work somewhere that you can leave a game set up and maybe come in early and have it ready to go throughout the day. And in that case, that's awesome. Maybe Mm -hmm. you can fit in two games during your breaks then. But for this list, we're going to assume that's not the case. Now, when first working on this list, my short list wasn't very short. It had a lot of games on it. Over 50 games I was able to find just from stuff I played and walking around my own game room. Um, So to cut down the list a bit, one of the first things I did was I eliminated any two-player only games. There is a great number of short two-player games. While it's possible people gaming at work only have on, on one other player who's interested in playing with, I think it's more likely to be a larger group of three or more. Plus, most of the games we're going to be calling out today do play fine just with two. They're just not two-player only. Another extra step we did to make this list as useful as possible is eliminating games that you can't easily buy right now. A shocking divergence from our usual lists, I know. Uh, Yeah, especially when we were doing the oddball games, when I was trying to find links for our show notes, I'm like, oh, wow, okay. I, I got to remember that the next time I do a game recommendation list, try to recommend games people can, can get because <laughs> we have gotten flack in the past for recommending awesome sounding games, but then people get frustrated because they can't actually find the games to purchase. So this time, absolutely everything on this list is currently available as of January 25th, 2023. Now, Tuesday, when this goes up, so goes live, maybe stuff will have sold out. But as of right now, <laughs> you can buy all these games. As usual, this list is in no particular order. All right, my first game that came to mind when talking about this was Fuse. Fuse is a real-time game that once you have it set up, there's a little bit of setup. You got to sort some dice out and some cards out, shuffle a deck, right? Once you got that going, it takes exactly 10 minutes because you are playing the game on a 10-minute timer. So on a 20-minute lunch break, you can probably fit in two games. Or sorry, a half hour lunch break. You can probably fit in two games and maybe in a 20 minute as long as you're really quick at setting it up. Now, what happens in this game is real time. You set a timer of 10 minutes. I recommend the official app because it will stress you out because you have this voice talking kind of GLaDOS like about the place about to explode. And you roll a bunch of dice and try to place them on cards. And you have to stack some dice and it's fast, furious card or sorry, dice drafting, trying to complete cards. If you get through all your cards, you win. If not, the place blows up. It's all about defusing a bomb fantastic quick play game that obviously is not going to be for everyone because it's real time it's cooperative and it does have a dexterity element 
But if those are all okay for you, this is a great one to get yourself pumped up during your break. And that was Fuse. Next up, we've got Tickets Ride New York or any of the other City series. Yep. This is a Ticket to Ride game I actually enjoy. I've never hidden the fact that I'm not a TTR fan. But this one, in large part because of its speed, really hit a sweet spot with a quick 15-minute play featuring all the same gameplay that just doesn't overstay its welcome. So you've got all the greatness, but you can fit possibly two two games of it in mm-hmm. that half-hour lunch break. Yeah, this is a simpler two to four player version of Ticket to Ride that I think is fantastic. It scratches that itch without taking all night. Uh, That is Ticket to Ride New York or Amsterdam or San Francisco or London, I think, at this point, if they haven't put out another one. Next, I have Breakdancing Meeple. I decided to start with the timer-based games with dexterity elements, though really not a lot of dexterity here. This is a board game that I think is just something that should have happened years ago that I can't believe it took so long. Um, You literally grab a group of five mini meeple, little wooden meeple, and roll them, hoping they land in specific patterns like on their feet, on their side, or on their head. And you're trying to fill in breakdancing move cards. And every time you fill it, you call out the move you just did, and you're going to score some points. You play over three rounds, and there's even a kind of deck building element where you're going to learn new moves between rounds. Really surprisingly deep game for how silly it is another timer game small box easy to throw into your lunch bag and that was breakdancing meeple next up i've got hanabi now while you can't talk about the cards you can still chat during the, this game of hidden information where you don't know what's in your hand but everybody else at the table does mm-hmm. and are trying to give you the best hints so that everyone can complete the game with limited information this is the sort of game you may rarely ever successfully finish, <laughs> but just getting a little bit closer every time is an exciting and fun achievement that can be played easily in about 20 minutes. Plus, if, Hanabi, if you play it at work, you're going to come up with your own little work-based um, language for communicating clues from each other, which is something I always find fascinating about Hanabi. My next one is another card game, and that is Red 7. Now, Red 7 is a game where at the end of your turn, you must be winning or else you lose, which sounds rather odd. But once you sit down and learn this game, you'll quickly learn it's all about modifying the game rules and playing cards out of your hand to build the tableau. Now, there is a slight problem with this one as a lunch break game. Play multiple rounds of Red 7. Just play until it's the buzzer goes and you have to put it away. There is a full set of scoring rules, which I actually really enjoy, but that makes the game a little too long because you're playing to a set point total. So Red 7 belongs on this list as long as you toss out the full scoring rules and you just play multiple rounds. And trust me, the game's fun enough. Without those rules, you're going to enjoy it either way. Plus has the ability of having special rules for the odd numbered cards if you want to toss that in to kind of spice things up once everyone's kind of figured out the base game. There we go. And that was Red 7. Now, next up, we've got either Codenames Regular or Codenames Duet. Team-based, either competitive or cooperative word-guessing game that can also be played just as easily in a casual manner without keeping score if people need to come and go as you're playing. Play as many rounds as you have time for. It's a fantastically flexible game uh, that allows you to have competitive, cooperative, or open-ended games mm-hmm. uh all just guessing words and trying to uh, avoid the assassins i'm gonna have to point this out because i pointed out every time we mention it code names duet is not a two-player only game it works perfectly fine actually excellently as a multiplayer team experience i personally prefer it to code names at all player counts and that is code names or code names duet or technically you could pick up one of the themed or picture versions as well Next, I have a game that I think already has been called out in the chat room, but people mention this one all the time when talking about quick filler games, and that is No Thanks. This is a game where you get a bunch of chips at the beginning of the game. Someone passes you a card, you either keep it or you have to toss a chip on it and pass it to the next player saying, no thanks, I don't want that one. And the reason you're doing this is you want to have the lowest score possible, which would be having no cards, but good luck with that. But you score your lowest possible numbered set. So if you get past a 13, but then you're able to get a 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, you only actually score eight points. 
that is the trick to no thanks. Uh, there's some awesome streams of people playing this. It is it really is one of the best filler games ever published. And again, being a filler game, perfect for that break. And that was no thanks. The game, not just what me telling you no. Uh, next <laughs> up, we have Sushi Go Party, the improved Sushi Go game with all the fun of the original, but more options to choose from. And with simultaneous actions happening, this game can really move quickly once everyone is familiar with all the different types of cards and they get a strategy in mind. And with Party, unlike the original, you change up the ingredients each game to keep mm -hmm. it fresh as sushi should always be. That was Sushi Go Party, which amuses me the most because Sean finally got to try Party and is now recommending this over Sushi Go. Uh, next, I have a very kind of toyetic, kind of big, big plastic game that you can find at your mass market stores and may not be perfect depending on the size of your break table, but that is Blockus. This is a polyomino placing game where you've got a giant grid and you're placing out polyomino shapes where each shape you place must touch your own shape, but only diagonally. It's all about cutting off sections of the board with the goal being to be the player who plays all of their pieces first. Then everyone else gets points for their leftover pieces if you want to keep an ongoing tally, though I think most likely you're just going to play a single game of Blockus and figure out who won. And that was Blockus. Now, next up I have The Crew. No surprise, finding trick-taking games on our list. And fans of Spades will love this one. This is a co-op, puzzle-based, two-to-five player trick-taking game where every round has a different goal. And when you run out of time, you just remember where you, were, where you left off and start again next break. Now, technically, there are two versions of the crew out there. We have only played the first one. Um, uh, search for planet nine yeah planet x planet x no that's a different game search for planet x is a is totally it? different game yeah. so i think it's search for planet nine now there's I two forget. versions of the crew <laughs> there are two there's now a deep sea adventures one we have not tried deep sea so i will recommend the original uh the crew but the other one i've heard is probably pretty good mission deep sea is the new one there but we, we can't remember the name of the old one <laughs> The Quest for Planet Nine. Um, I, that's, I think, what it is. The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine. Sorry about that. Next up, I have New York Slice. This is a pizza game. What better theme for a lunch break? Especially because you could technically play this with actual pizza, but you're going to have to order, I think, six or seven different types. Uh, this is a game that uses the I split, you choose mechanic, which is fascinating, where one player has to divide up a pizza then everyone else gets to draft slices and they get what's left over. So there's a ton of strategy in trying to, you know, make it so that you don't make a pie too juicy and you still want to get what you need. Uh, scoring is based on having sets of different types of pizza, and it introduces an interesting card make mechanic called Today's Special that gives you a special way to score and break the rules. This is a fantastic game with a great theme, great looking tiles, and even the um, the score sheet looks like a, a receipt book, which I just... Everything about this game just screams theme. I love the I split you choose mechanic. And I got to say, like for lunchtime games, you're even sticking with the theme of lunch here. And that was New York Slice. Next up, we have Drop It, a Connect 4 that's actually fun. <laughs> a shape-based, gravity-driven puzzle game that plays different every time. And with two to four player options or team play, mm -hmm. as well as multiple official variants in the game, in the rule book, there's a lot to love about a lunchtime game of Drop It. But do watch out you're not being, dropping any food in there. Luckily, yeah. it is washable, though. That, that's kind of disturbing. Yeah, Drop It, we just reviewed this one last week or the week before. I think it was just last week. So check out our review for how much we actually love Drop It. Spoiler, it's awesome. That's why it's on this list. Um, the best thing I heard about Drop It is someone on Twitter called it uh, chaotic evil Tetris. And I'm like, that might even be better than connect four for gamers. And that was drop it. Next up. I have probably the lightest game on the entire list, but great. If you also want to chat while having your break and complain about your bosses or your work environment and say something other than hardly working, working hard. Um, that is rumble in the dungeon, which also could be rumble in the house. And I think there's also a Cthulhu themed one, though. I don't remember the name of that one. 
Uh, this is a really simple game where you build a dungeon, you put 10 characters out on there, you randomly are assigned two of those characters, and your goal is to be the last man standing, or last creature standing, or woman standing in that case. Sorry, last last person standing. Last thing or orcs standing. Producers. Yeah, or the last thing standing, I guess. I'm like, the last monster, the, the last dungeon denizen remaining. Um, really simple game. You either move a piece or you choose two pieces together, two or more pieces together, and decide which one of them dies. That's pretty much just taught you how to play. There is a little bit more to it with the treasure chest, infinitely replayable. And like I said, super light. So this is a great conversation game that you can just hang out and talk and chat while slowly killing off the other denizens of the dungeon. And that was Rumble in the Dungeon or Rumble in the whatever else they've managed to publish <laughs> in that uh, theme. Now, next up, I've got Thrones of Valeria. Now, back to more trick taking, this time with a different twist. The winning suit can change during the hand. And mm -hmm. it, rather than hands won, it's coins earned that make this card game stand out as a two to six player game with team variants as well for those Euchre lovers out there. Now, this one is going to take a little bit of time. Uh, if you are not a trick-taking gamer, you're may, this one may take a little longer. But uh, for trick-taking gamers, once they've uh, had a couple of hands behind them and are used to it, this game will fit right in nicely. Yeah, I will say our first couple of games were a little longer, but once everyone internalized what each of the cards did and got the mechanics down, you can easily complete a game in under half an hour. Next up, one that is another lighter game that is just kind of neat. You might even learn something we were playing, and that is Timelines. Now, I'm not calling out a specific version of Timelines. There are tons of them, and you can mix and match them. This is where you get a hand of cards, one card's put on the table, then the next player has to play another card in timeline order, either before or after that. And the next player is going to play a card, and do they put it before or after both of those or between them, trying to make a solid timeline where everything is in chronological order. So it's things like, do you know when the space shuttle launch was in comparison to the invention of the bicycle and to comparison when Louis Armstrong was born, for example, just as three random ones, um, including like there's mythical sets as well. So it's not all historically based. A slightly educational game, but this is another one that you can easily chat. And half the fun is when you reveal everything and everyone's like, wow, I didn't realize the bicycle was invented before. And I'm not going to throw something out here because I'll just be wrong. <laughs> Um, or whatever, that, that Betty White really is older than sliced bread. I know, I don't know if that was a true fact, but that's at least one I saw on the internet at once. Um, fun game, super, lots of different versions out there you can pick up. And that was Timelines. And next up, I've got The Game. Unlike some games, you can talk some during this game. <laughs> you just can't give out any specific details. Playing with that communication is great fun and makes this seemingly simple game of putting cards in order great fun for one to five players, though three is really the sweet spot for this one. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the game. Deanna and I like to keep this in the van, and we play it on date nights or out at restaurants or at a pub or whatever. So I personally enjoy it. Two-player plays grade three. I don't even think there's a problem at five, though you don't get as much of a... Your hand is pretty large, so it becomes much more difficult at the higher player counts. And that is the horribly named the game the game next i have another card game there's a lot of card games on this list it seems because while well, they're small portable and tend to be fairly short and that is dead man's draw this is a push your luck game and honestly one of my favorite push your luck games i've ever played where you are going to draw a card from a deck and put it face up then you're going to decide if you draw another card or stop there are multiple different suits each of them do some interesting things in the game because it turns out it's a tableau building game. So you're going to keep drawing cards, but as soon as you draw a single duplicate of the same suit, we'll say, even though they're like anchors, swords, and cannons, you bust and all the cards go away. But at any point you stop, you then collect all the cards and their special abilities go off. Swords let you make other players dis steal, uh, discard cards. Hooks let you steal cards from other players. Treasure chests let you reveal three cards from the deck and then... Um, decide if you want to keep them or not, and so on. It's it's a really fascinating game where every suit does something different, but the goal is actually to collect the highest number in each suit through this really unique push-your-luck mechanic. This is one that should be on the Sean Should Try It list the next time we've got a big group together, because this is a nice quick one as well. And that was Dead Man's Draw. 
And next up, we've got Splendor, but this one you're going to want to stick with experienced spend Splendor players and take some time familiarizing people with it before you sit down for mm -hmm. some real games. This one can be a bit rough for newer players unfamiliar with it, but if they can learn it and get comfortable, you can certainly get this game down in 30 minutes or less. This chip collecting tableau building set collection game is a perennial favorite and you can even get it in Marvel form to make it more familiar to players. Supposedly there are some changes to the Marvel edition, but I don't know what they are. I know my wife and daughter can fire off two games in half an hour easily. That is Splendor. Next, we have Yardmaster, which I thought for sure I would delete from this list as not available, but I found it for sale, so it's still out there. This is a train yard set collection game where you are going to play sets of cards to collect train cars. The cool part here is you can only connect a new freight car to your growing train line if it matches the color or exact number of the car before it. There are only four different numbers, one, two, three, four, and there are four ones and only one four in each color. There's even some trading involved in this where you can trade in two of a kind for another. Um, this kind of even has a ticket to ride feel the way you're trading in cards. It's got some really neat mechanics where you can collect trains that don't latch onto your train right away because they're wrong and they stay in your yard. But then eventually, if you get a, the right card out, all the stuff in your yard could suddenly combo out and fill up your train. It's a race to a set number of points, which is based on the player count. A great quick game and surprisingly quick enough to fit in under half an hour, even though there is a Yardmaster Express that's even quicker. I personally do recommend Yardmaster over a Yardmaster Express. There's just a little bit more going on, and I find it more enjoyable. Yardmaster Express, instead of buying cards and trading, is drafting. You get a hand of cards, and you pass them, trying to make your train. All right, and that was Yardmaster. Next up, we've got Railroad Inc. Now, the hardest part about Railroad Inc. is figuring out which version to buy or play with. Yes. You roll some dice and draw the results on a small erasable board. Everyone uses the same dice, but comes up with very different results. Mm. Now, one set gets you up to six players, but with more sets, you can add more players. The number of drawing boards is the only limit on this game. Now, I know someone who streamed a hundred player game of Railroad Inc. at one point. That is Railroad Inc. Next, Shikoku. Uh, the race game that does something different. We reviewed this one at the end of last year. This is a game where you are playing cards to move up a temple in Japan where you don't want to be first. It's all about moderation. The player who gets to the top of the temple is eliminated. And you don't want to be too slow because, again, it's about moderation. The player at the bottom is also eliminated. And it's actually the players in the second to first to, and second to last players who win this race game. It's got a really neat mechanic for drafting your cards. Um, really simple theme, really quick to teach. People will pick this up after one play and a short play time perfect for your breaks. And that was Hikoku. Now next up, I've got Point Salad. Now the first game may go a little slower, but once people are familiar, this is a blindingly fast set collection card game where you're choosing both how and what you score from the same card pool. Mm -hmm. Two to six players of healthy food goodness for your lunchtime. And that was Point Salad. Next, I have Stellar Conflict, another rather unique game. This is a card-driven space battle game um, where you have your army, which once you use the advanced rules, you actually build from a set of cards, and it's all different ships with lasers pointing out different directions as well as some asteroids, and then shields on different sides, and you literally throw these cards down onto the table, and then everyone has a set time limit to put all their cards out. Once that time limit goes off, everyone has to stop, and then you resolve the battle, starting by a ship initiative number, using elastics to figure out what ships hit, hit which, getting points for destroying other ships, as well as stealing cargo from them. It is one of the most unique games I own, and I've got to say this is a good one for excitement level, where you're trying to resolve it, and you're like, oh, I think I got him, I think I got him, and you reach it out. And they said, the only game I know that uses elastics as a range ruler, which i got to say is brilliant for a line of sight mechanic. Uh, that is that is one of the most unique games that, that um, Stronghold Games has ever published. 
Um, it's awesome because at Origins, they were giving away coasters at Barley's that was an expansion for this. So I actually have like a boss thing or it's a space station on the other side. A really unique game. All right. Well, that was Stellar Conflict. Next up, I have Ven. Now, this one may not leave you feeling quite as refreshed when you're done your lunch yeah. as it can be a bit on the brain burning side, at least as the clue giver. But otherwise, a light, friendly team-based guessing game with an interesting twist about how you're giving the clues using a Venn diagram and some interesting art. <laughs> yeah, the, the number of ways we will say to talk about the art in Venn. Uh, you know, if this game came out now, it would probably have AI generated art because it's like a bunch of clip art mashed together that once you play it a few times, you realize are actually tied to the words in the game. So it makes a little more sense and not quite as like, what the heck are all these emojis and cats and rainbows on these cards? That was Ven. I uh, sticking with the op who produced Ven, the next one. And my final one for our list tonight is Hughes and Cues. Uh, this one is you get a giant color board that looks like you're in Windows Paint or Photoshop and just went to change your color, showing the entire rainbow of colors. And then the clue giver gets a card with four colors on it. It picks what color they want of those four and then gives a one word clue. All the rest of players place a little clone cone, not clone cone on the board where they think that color is. Then the clue giver looking at their answers now gives a two word clue to hopefully hone things in. Then they reveal what their actual color was, put this little tray thing out and everyone scores points for how close they were, including the person who gave the clue getting points for the people who are closest. Really simple to learn game, really quick to play, engaging enough. And this is one of those games where the actual fun isn't necessarily giving the clues and putting your cones out. It's the discussion after the round where what do you mean you think shark teeth are this color? They're obviously way more yellow. Or you start talking about how, you know what, there are actually multiple different colors of tulip, which is an actual conversation I had with someone after a game who was picturing red ones when I pictured yellow. All right. And that was cues and cues. And if you happen to work at a biotech startup, maybe you can put clones down on the board. There you go. If you work at a paint factory or something, you know, if you're, if you're in the paint department at Home Depot, you got to bring hues and cues. But then you got to call them out by their Pantone colors and not the actual numbers on the board. It'd be too easy. You just show up you're like Pantone 2568. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, that's Bayer eggshell. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. All right. We do have some honorable mentions tonight. Not a, just kind of a random number. Uh, every single one of these are games I see people recommend often, but are games I have not played or don't personally enjoy. Um, all the power to you. If you enjoy these games, you're welcome to enjoy them. I'm not trying to say they're bad games, but I want to put them out there for people to check out because even though I don't like them, you may enjoy them as well or as uh, more than I do enjoy them as well when I don't. Uh, number one is Escape Curse of the Temple. This is just one I don't own. This is a Queen Games game where you build a temple out of tiles and you roll dice furiously to a soundtrack and you are rolling and rolling and moving your people and trying to escape Indiana Jones style from the temple that is, you know, cursing you and like, you'll be cursed. So you can't roll different dice. So, to be honest, I've never actually played this, but I've seen it played. Um, our friend, Jamie, uh, Will Chamberlain in the chat, if he happens to be present tonight, I don't know if he's there, um, has brought it out to multiple events and really enjoyed it. This game's old enough, though, that when we used to play, he brought a CD player. So I have to assume there's probably an app version of a, the Escape from the Curse of the Temple soundtrack, or it's on Spotify or something now, and you don't need a CD to play. But really, uh, the Fast Furious and like a step up from Fuse, if you want more of a gamer's game with that kind of same feel, kind of like Fuse. And that was Escape Curse of the Temple. And this next one's popped up a few times in our chat room already. And that is Love Letter and all the various versions of it. The 18 card game that, that has popped up and taken the world by storm. I don't know what it is. I don't love Love Letters. I, I never have since the first time I played it. The original edition with the, the little red cubes for hearts and, and the original theme. Um, then I actually I thought I would prefer the Japanese theme because it was originally a Japanese game that was translated into English where it's all about getting a letter to a princess. Even that one, like I like the art on it better, but I don't love it. 
of all of them, my favorite is actually Lucha Efe, which is a worldwide wrestling or wrestling luchador, technically, um, game where you actually are playing two cards. So you have your character and someone in your corner. That's my personal favorite version of Love Letter, but it is extremely popular. You can get the Jabba's Palace version. You can get Adventure Time version. There's a million different versions of Love Letter out there. Very popular for a large group of people. Sorry, I don't love it. Just not the game for me, but I totally get it. And I got to say, for time, space constraints, perfect for a break time. And that was Love Letter and all the various versions of Love Letter. Next, I have One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which could be One Night Ultimate whatever. I put werewolf on this list, but there's superheroes, there's villains, there's vampires, there's a Daybreak expansion. This takes that social deduction game of werewolf and does two very important things. For one, it makes it one round. You literally play one round of werewolf and figure out who it is at the end. The second thing it does is removes the requirement to have a moderator, which I've got to say is a huge improvement. That's something I do not like about many of the werewolf and mafia and do you worship Cthulhu games is someone doesn't get to play the game. I still don't love social deduction. So that's why this is in our honorable mentions. It's not my favorite mechanic. It's probably my least favorite mechanic. But if you're going to convince me to play one of these games, the one night version is what I prefer. And uh, it's up to you whether or not social deduction and possibly lying to your coworkers <laughs> is going to be a healthy workplace experience. So there's a lot less lying in the one night one. It's much more deduction and pointing at people. You don't get the whole discussion. No, I'm not a werewolf because of this as much in this particular game, which is why I think I do tolerate this one more. And that is the one night ultimate series. All right. This one, I feel bad because every time people talk about quick, fast playing games, they talk about cockroach poker. I have had cockroach poker show up anytime I talk about quick games, filler games, great filler games. I need to do it sometime and do some research. I have no idea what this game's about. I, I have never looked it up. I should have, before the show tonight, verified exactly what it was about. I know it's it's a, a card game. That's all I can tell you. And the fact that if I didn't mention it, someone in the comments would have mentioned Where's Cockroach Poker. All right. And, well, if you happen to work at, uh, I don't know, a uh, exterminator company, maybe Cockroach Poker would be perfect for your lunchroom. I am very glad you went with Exterminator. I thought you were going somewhere else. <laughs> Next up, I have one. Our chat room is already called out, and that is Zombie Dice from Steve Jackson Games. There are other versions of this, too. There's like Alien Dice, and there's expansions for this, and it's basically a push-your-luck game where you keep rolling the dice and trying to escape from the zombies and not get bit. Um, great, quick-playing, fast game, silly fun, highly random, not a lot of player agency, but still enjoyable. Because of that, I don't love it. I find it's a little too random for that same type of game. I'd rather play, say, Dead Man's Draw. But I get it. People love this game, and I think it belongs at least as an honorable mention tonight. Yeah, that was Zombie Dice. And now the next one's name might put some people off, but it could be worth convincing them to get past that. And that is Monopoly Duel, the... It's the good version of Monopoly, or the... There's actually a good version of Monopoly. It's Monopoly Deal. Or no, there is actually one good Monopoly game out there, version of Monopoly, as we've been told many, many times. Uh, similar to Cockroach Poker, I've got to say, someday I'm going to pick this game up and I'm going to play it. I, I think the Monopoly game name does scare me away, despite the assurances of many, many gamers. This is actually a good game. It's all about collecting a set of um, properties in your hand. Uh, interestingly, uh, we would have had a copy of Monopoly Deal, but... During a Black Friday sale, I could not get it into my checkout box. Wow. I could not. I could not. It was like three dollars <laughs> on Amazon, and it for whatever reason the site was having problems, and I could not buy a copy of Monopoly Deal. See, I keep seeing it for twelve bucks at our local Shoppers Drug Mart, and I just know that's higher than it should be. So I, I just can't do it. I, I correction from our chat room. Again, these are games I don't play myself. So zombie dice actually saw you are the zombie trying not to get shot. Right. So I have played a game where you were playing the humans trying not to get bit. So I don't know if that's a very, an expansion or what. So more correction on zombie dice. You are the zombies trying to not get shot. Next, we have another push your luck game that everyone recommends. It's from oink games. It's called deep sea adventure. Based on every podcast that mentions this, every review I've seen, it's amazing. 
I personally can't justify the cost on Oink Games. Oink Games are way too expensive for how small they are. But based on everyone's recommendation, it seems like it's really worth it. The game's probably going to get enough play to justify the price. It's all about diving deep underwater based on dice rolls and deciding when to start coming back up. Uh, it's kind of like, I don't know, a, a multiplayer can't stop going deeper. I, I've heard lots of good things. I just, I hate Oink Games price points, though obviously it works well enough for them because enough people recommend Deep Sea Adventures. All right, well, that is it for a not-so-short list of shorter games great for playing during a break from work. Well, what's your favorite short game? Let us know in the comments. Now, we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder that we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. Clicking on Ask the Bellhop at TabletopBellhop.com, sending an email to questions at TabletopBellhop.com, or hitting me up on social media could get your ans questions answered. You can find me everywhere online as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. 